Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And one thing that we definitely like to do here is talk about the legalities of an industry that we love, the video game industry. So it comes as no surprise that late last night I was actually contacted by a number of people, not just one, who informed me of a story they felt was brewing and that I wasn't necessarily fully sure about. This was mirrored in a tweet that I saw from late last night, Ash R here on Twitter, at Ash underscore 735. And this individual says the following, Take Two have gone on a rampage of trademark disputes. They claim that they own the words Rockstar, Take Two, Bully, and all variants. Remember that slippery slope? They're even trying to claim Hazelight Games, It Takes Two, is profiting off their brand. It Takes Two being a cooperative game that I believe is nominated for Game of the Year at the Game Awards next week. Now, I see these stories to some extent quite often. I get a lot of messages. I'm very thankful for all the people that drop me tips and lines about what they want to see in this video series on this channel. But very often, it's not something that I think is a perfect fit for the channel or it doesn't rise to the level that I think is happening. And I don't know that necessarily I would describe what we're going to talk about as a rampage. But I will say, when I looked into all this, and I'm going to do my best to make the trademark trial and appeal board inquiry system interesting to you all, it was surprising the aggression and volume of interactions through this kind of objection framework that Take-Two has actually had in this space. If we look at just this page, we can scroll down to the bottom. We see 25 interactions, objections to potentially issued trademarks, or other things, which we'll talk about as part of this video, 25 in the last three months. This only goes down to September 7th, 2021. Now, that could be a lot, might not be a lot, depends on the industry, depends on the company. So I wanted to take a look at a few comparison examples so that we could get a feel for what that is. If we look at Electronic Arts, for instance, you see they have 25 interactions for the last six years, not three months. Similarly, Activision, goes all the way back to 2014. That's seven years. Famously combative ZeniMax, who had article after article written about how they were trying to protect the trademarks that they saw fit to protect, goes all the way back to 2014 in the last 25 interactions. In fact, you have to go back to the kind of 2016, 2017, 2018 area to see them fighting about scrolls, to see them fighting about prey, pray for the gods, et cetera, et cetera. In the recent past, They've only had a couple of interactions in the last year. So when we're looking at something like 25 interactions in the last three months, we do know that Take-Two is engaged in some aggressive trademark policing. But before we can talk about it as a rampage or anything like that, we also have to look a little bit farther. If you're on this board, I'm going to link this, of course, in the description, and you see these kinds of things, it's important to note a couple of things as part of this board. If you see just the Take-Two Interactive software name, it means that they haven't filed an objection as of yet. In fact, every time you see that, as best I can tell while going through all of this, you see that Take-Two has just requested an extension for the time period under which they are allowed to object to the issuance of this given trademark. We'll talk a little bit about more what that means in just a second. But ultimately, when we're looking at all this, we're really only fully concerned with where you see this big list of trademarks. And that's not not often in the last 25 interactions, but it's not all of them. And if we go further and we look further through this list, you see a lot of these are just time extensions. And certainly we'll talk about It Takes Two, we'll talk about Hazelight, and it's not quite as bad as it might initially seem. And yet, what you do see here is a form of trademark aggression that tends to chill things, right? If you're sitting across from me in my room, first of all, I'm directing you to a trademark attorney, not myself, because I don't handle the USPTO interactions directly. I send you to somebody who does it every day and knows the names of the examiners you're going to be talking to, et cetera, et cetera. I would tell you that if we just do a quick check of this particular company, if you're going to use the word rockstar or bully or take two or anything like that, You've got all the evidence you need of someone that is very, very aggressive and is willing to file an extension seemingly every time one of their words pops up in a trademark search, that they want you to have to think about it. They want you to avoid these words. They are policing their trademark, what I would argue, much greater, much more broadly in scope than the trademark law actually protects for them. 
on the understanding that a lot of people are going to look at this and say, ah, it's not worth the trouble. Or they're going to change the trademark as it's entered, which we'll also talk about, or otherwise just drop things. And so take two is, as best I can tell, the most aggressive at this right now. So this isn't incorrect. It's just not necessarily a rampage. So let's talk about what all of this means. For one thing, we see as an example in some of these applications that Take-Two is potentially arguing against the following description of the goods and services to which the trademark is applied for. And this I thought was really interesting. We'll come back to this towards the end of the video. But we see here an application to do bicycles that wants to use the word rockstar. It says for electric bikes, bicycles, comma, none of the foregoing relating to or promoting entertainment software, video games, or computer games. It's a bit of a non sequitur if you're filing a document with the trademark office. And yet we can see that this is a lawyer that is doing their homework and is looking at exactly what Take-Two is trying to extract as part of this trademark process. We'll come back to that because we first have to understand exactly what a trademark is for. And that's part of this story. Trademark infringement, as the USPTO describes it, is the unauthorized use of a trademark or service mark in connection with goods and or services in a manner that is likely to cause confusion, deception, or mistake about the source of the goods or services. Now, I'm talking about infringement here, even though we're talking about objections to the issuance of a trademark, because what we're really arguing, what the discussion is really about, is essentially avoiding pre-infringement. As the USPTO says, to support a trademark infringement claim in court, a plaintiff must prove that it owns a valid mark, that it has priority in its mark, and that the defendant's mark is likely to cause confusion in the minds of consumers about the source or sponsorship of the goods or services offered under the party's mark. When a plaintiff owns a federal trademark registration, as Take-Two does to words like rock star, etc., there is a legal presumption of the validity and ownership of the mark, as well as of the exclusive right to use the mark nationwide or in connection with the goods or services listed in the registration. The key factors considered in most cases are the degree of similarity between the marks at issue and whether the party's goods and or services are sufficiently related that consumers are likely to assume, mistakenly, that they come from a common source. Other factors that courts typically consider include how and where the party's goods or services are advertised, marketed, and sold, purchasing conditions, the range of prospective purchasers of goods and services, whether there is any evidence of, you know, folks actually getting confused because otherwise it's kind of a hypothetical argument, And all of these things vary from case to case. Now, when you file for a trademark, there's a whole process here. If the examining attorney raises no objections, or if you overcome their objections, they will put it for publication in the quote unquote official gazette. We're very quaint in the USPTO, a weekly publication. And after the mark is published, any party who believes it may be damaged by registration of the mark has 30 days from the publication date to file either an opposition to registration, which is a more formal document we're going to look at, or to request to extend the time to oppose. An opposition is similar to a proceeding in a federal court, but is held before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, an administrative tribunal within the USPTO, which is exactly what you see happening here, right? All of these are, it's in the official gazette, take two looks at it, files for an extension, files for an extension. Actually, argues the point for don't be a rock star, be a legend. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Files an extension, files an extension, files an extension, etc. They want to put the fear of God in you. And that's fine. They've got these trademarks to police, but we can ask the question of whether or not this isn't at bare minimum an aggressive use of policing trademarks, especially when we start talking about the goods and services in question for some of these. Now, overall, you are supposed to be able to get a trademark under the U.S. trademark law. No trademark by which the goods of the applicant may be distinguished from the goods of others shall be refused registration unless, and we've got a couple of these here, we don't allow immoral, deceptive, or scandalous matter here in the U.S. Of course not. Or, more importantly for this conversation, it can be denied if it consists of or comprises a mark which so resembles a mark already registered or a mark or trade name previously used in the United States by another and not abandoned as to be likely when used or on or in connection with the goods of the applicant to cause confusion. All of this, everything in trademark land is related to whether or not somebody would be confused about who made that product or who performed that service. Anything else is not trademark and anything else 
you're not supposed to be able to police. So when we're talking about objections, I pulled up a regulation here. It says examples of available grounds for opposition and for cancellation of an existing registered trademark are listed below. This list is exemplary, not exhaustive, as we talk about a lot. If it causes confusion, if it's merely descriptive, if it's geographically deceptive, or one thing that we'll see in a lot of these documents that are put forth by Take Two is if they are blurring or diluting a famous mark. And here, they're a little aggressive as well. When we look at these documents, we'll see in a lot of places, they want to claim whatever they're talking about is quote unquote famous. And it's important to distinguish this. Famous doesn't mean what you or I might think. We might think Rockstar is famous. Grand Theft Auto is famous. For the most part, we're talking about something bigger than that. Some of the most widely recognized and famous trademarks include Google, Walmart, Vodafone, Rolex, Clorox, Kodak, Exxon, Victoria's Secret. And while some courts may use the terms well-known and famous trademarks interchangeably, there is a difference between the two. Since the definition of well-known means that it is widely known by many to achieve well-known status, the trademark will need to be known to a substantial segment of the relevant public. In contrast, a famous mark is considered a mark that is well-known and has a high degree of reputation associated with it, generally speaking, regardless of whether or not you use that product or service, right? That everybody on earth knows what a Coca-Cola is, even if you don't want it and you don't drink it. That everybody knows roughly what Google is, what Walmart is. And what we have here with Rockstar's complaints is a little bit broader than that, right? Let's take a look at one of those examples I promised, right? We've got here their opposition document, their objection, to the registration of a trademark that has been filed for, for don't be a rock star, be a legend. And I've skipped all the pages in which they talk about, hey, we're rock star, we've got the R logo, et cetera, et cetera. They say, they object to don't be a rock star, be a legend for, and this is what the applicant actually filed it for, carrying cases for mobile devices, laptops, tablets, portable readers, earbuds, and portable media players, battery charger for use with mobile devices, eyewear, eyewear cases, eyeglass chains and cords, USB flash drives, namely blank USB flash drives, planners, namely electronic day planners, pen trays, letter trays, desk trays, namely desk file trays, desk sets, pens, pencils, paper clips, stationery, and I'm going to stop right there. But suffice it to say, for the most part, we're not talking about video games. We're rock stars, Use of their marks mostly lives. Now, they have a lot of explanations for the fact that they're ready to make sweatshirts and they're selling clothes and all these various things that could potentially run afoul of the combination of don't be a rock star, be a legend. But when you get down to it, when they have to say something like applicants' goods and services are identical and or closely related to opposers' goods and services bearing our marks. So they're trying to establish that this will be confusing to people that if you see the word rock star in virtually any context, that that could cause a problem. And as I promised, they say that this is based on a possibility and likelihood of confusion and dilution by blurring, which again requires that mark to be famous. Is the word rock star famous in this context? I would argue that it isn't, but that would be up to the courts to decide ultimately if it proceeded to that point in time. So you see these opposition documents, But ultimately, you see some that are maybe not so good, and you see some that are okay, right? When we look at this one, this one is about 42 dot, and this is for downloadable computer software for database management, and I don't even have to read anymore, because when we're talking about computer software, even if it's enterprise software, even if it's serious software, you start to get into an issue. We're not really going to separate video games from computer software. It's played on the same device. It does kind of the same thing, even though one is serious, one is not. You're going to have a better argument if you're the take twos of the world than you are for just stopping somebody from making whatever it is that don't be a rock star, be a legend actually is selling. Additionally, we get a whole description of the Dots series of puzzle games, which I have to admit for purposes of this conversation, I had never heard of, but which Rockstar tells the court or tells the tribunal in this case is something that's very, very popular, that it's a mobile puzzle game that they've sold a lot. We get that same dilution by blurring. You see a lot of these documents that they file are almost kind of boilerplate. And while I think this is a stronger kind of case, it also isn't a gimme, certainly not on the famous standpoint, but you do see them policing what are their words. And they make some good points here that they have a game called Two Dots and 42 Dot really is kind of similar when you say it that way. It's software. Here's one for Take Tro that makes eyeglasses, telescopes, bicycles, speedometers, etc. And they say, 
there's a there's a line in here that I won't bother to go find in page 35 or whatever that says if you say take two and take tro very fast they sound the same. It's like well I'm not I'm not sure that's accurate and it's important to note when we have this conversation as I said as I quoted the USPTO it's in connection with the goods and services listed in the registration. Now Rockstar Take Two has registered for a number of different things but. The biggest one is their video games and their entertainment services, etc. They do have legitimate beefs with some of these folks. And if you're going to aggressively police your trademarks, you're going to wind up with something that looks like this. This R with a lion on it is for entertainment services, namely an ongoing series featuring video games provided through the internet. You probably want to avoid the word video games if you're making this application. I don't think this R looks anything like the Rockstar R, but... When they talk about these kinds of things, it's really all just boilerplate and the same kind of argument that they bring against all of these individual applicants. Now, I promised you we were going to talk about what Take-Two was seeking out of this. The answer is, if you click on all of these things that Take-Two has done, you'll see a couple of things. One, you'll see those extensions. You'll see them filed for oftentimes in a row just to keep the extension going before they decide either to drop it or they decide to bring their opposition And if they don't, you often see something like this. With a poser's consent and a poser's withdrawal, hey, this is what we filed for, Grub Rockstar Catering, and this is what we're willing to do instead. And you can see the overall objection, at least from the Take-Two side of things, appears to be not the name, but the font, I would be willing to bet, on Rockstar itself and the prominence it was given in the logo. So ultimately, you've got an applicant that says, all right, it's not worth the trouble. We're already going through this whole process. We will change the logo of our company so that you go away. And Take-Two knows this. And Take-Two is delivering a message with this kind of action to other lawyers, to other folks that could potentially use the word Rockstar or the letter R or the name Dot or Dots or Two Dots, or as it turns out, Take-Two itself and saying, go away. You don't even want to get into this because we will just make your lives miserable. We'll extend it so you don't know if you get it. We'll extend it again. We'll extend it again. You don't get your trademark. And then maybe we'll drop it. Maybe you'll drop it. There's a number of entries here that say, yeah, it's a default on the part of the applicant. They never really answered. And so this is designed to get you to never even try. Also, it's designed to have you limit your own trademark before we get down to business. As you can see here, Art of the Piano Rockstar axe throwing on our thumbnail here, agreed to the following adjustment. They asked for a trademark for entertainment in the nature of axe throwing competitions, instruction in the nature of hatchet and axe throwing lessons, and providing sports facilities for hatchet and axe throwing. Take two objected, said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're using the word rockstar in your axe throwing company. We don't like that. We are going to file an opposition document. We're going to make your lives miserable for some period of time. Until you give us this, on September 30th, you agree to this kind of change. What did you change it to? Same services and goods with the following proviso. None of the foregoing relating to or promoting software, computer games, or video games. You see this in a number of places. That Take-Two is trying to extract the notion that you can't bring this name. Regardless of the fact that Rockstar Axe Throwing doesn't sound much like Rockstar the company itself, You're going to agree before adjudication, before it can cause any trouble for us to say you're not going to make software, computer games, or video games right now. Now, that works for most people. Most people aren't going to take their axe-throwing company and decide to make an app out of it, but it's also very, very aggressive, and it's designed not just for Rockstar axe-throwing. It's designed for the use of Rockstar on electric bicycles, that a good lawyer and a client that wants to avoid dealing with our team of attorneys will put it in before we even have to ask. And you're thereby policing the environment here before it even causes you trouble just by aggression against all comers. And certainly if you are a trademark attorney or a copyright attorney or anybody that deals with these kinds of things, you might have your own feelings as to whether or not this is a legitimate way to run your business, right? You are extending everybody that bothers to come anywhere near your names. Here's Hip Rockstar, Max Payne GV, Triple Dot Studios, Rockstar Authors and Tattoo Parlors, Roost R, 
Rockstar the word for Scoot Star, which we were just talking about. The Dots, restaurant rock stars. There's one that's called Rockstar Kitchen, I believe, that wants to do videos about cooking with actual rock stars playing music while they learn to cook. Sounds interesting. Take two objected to it. And so that's the real question here is whether or not you're okay with the company going out and aggressively making life miserable for anybody that comes near their words without actually, generally, going through the entire opposition process. Essentially, making the process the punishment so that nobody decides to come anywhere near the scope of their wording. And they aren't the first and they certainly won't be the last to do this kind of thing. It's not necessarily illegal, but it is certainly aggressive. Finally, we come to what I think drew a lot of people's attention to that tweet, especially since it was referenced directly in there. It was also referenced to me by some of the folks that contacted me, and that's It Takes Two. Very, very popular video game. Highly recommend it. An excellent game in 2021. And you see here, It Takes Two filed for an application for its name, and it was ultimately abandoned. If we actually look at this process here, you see the application, you see it Official Gazette publication for opposition. Then you see the extensions of time to oppose come in. And ultimately you see abandonment of their attempt to file this trademark. Now, why do they abandon it? I can't answer that question. I can't read their minds. But I can say that it takes two as a name probably isn't super useful even to the electronic arts of the world. If you look up It Takes Two in trademark land, you'll see it referenced on all sorts of things. It Takes Two is a very popular phrase. It's a very common phrase, and it's on all sorts of products, all sorts of goods and services, including a number of them related to the pandemic and things very, very recently. So there's a limited value in all likelihood for electronic arts and actually getting and receiving this trademark, especially when it's opposed by Take Two Interactive. Now, it might be the case that they did something else that I can't see in these documents or publishing materials where they got that trademark anyway, but at least as presented as opposed by Take-Two Interactive, it's shown as abandoned as of the spring of this year. So did Take-Two Interactive combat this? They extended the time that they wanted to look at this a couple times, and then they went away because it looks like Electronic Arts, Hazelight, whoever was in charge of this, effectively dropped it. So the question becomes, how do you feel about all this? I wanted to walk you through what I saw in terms of the filings that Take-Two Interactive made. And I certainly think that Take-Two is representing that they own more than they do. That this rock star name only applies, as long as this list is, to the use that they have actually filed for it. You can see that for every instance of rock star that was granted to Take-Two Interactive, there has to be a related set of goods and services. Here, clothing, shirts, t-shirts, sweatshirts, leisure jackets, headgear, etc. And so when we're talking about their policing of all this, they can have some good claims, they can have some bad claims. The most concerning thing to my eye is the fact that they apparently decided to file against anyone and everyone that would deign to come close to their trademarked rights. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this, please consider supporting the channel. We talk about the business and law of technology and video games all the time. Otherwise, just subscribing and telling your friends. Every little bit helps us grow as a channel and have these discussions. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.